Great, welcome everybody to uh, the Toronto office. This is another installment of Talks at Google. Uh, we have a special guest here, a hometown boy, Rob Stewart, a documentarian, educator, conservationist. Um, he's behind the movies Sharkwater and Revolution, and he's in town for the Toronto International Film Festival, uh, where he's already uh, you know, making moves to make the second movie, Sharkwater 2. Um, Thank you for coming. Interviewing him is Adam Green, who is an agency lead for creative agencies here based out of Toronto. And uh, thanks, guys. I'll let you get to it. Awesome. Thanks for coming in, Rob. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I, I just want to go, go over, for those of you who don't know, Rob, uh, biologist, conservationist, activist, as, as Vera said, filmmaker. Um, you also might be the Indiana Jones of the conservation world. Some of the stuff that you've done is, is really uh, wildly out there. Um, but sharks are your passion. Um, uh, shark water, obviously, uh, no surprise, about sharks. Why them? What was it about sharks that originally captured your interest? I think many, at least young guys, feel this way. Sharks are like dragons and dinosaurs, but they're actually here. You know, they're super cool. We know so little about them. Even today, we don't know how big most of them get, how long they live, where they mate, what they do. So they're enigmatic in that way. And uh, as a little kid, you know, you start flipping through books and you realize they were here before trees. They were here before dinosaurs by 200 million years. They were here before the oxygen concentrations in our atmosphere were at 21% before the continents sat in their current position. So like as rulers of this planet, sharks are the most badass creatures the planet's ever seen. So as a little kid, they were just fascinating. So you mentioned there that, that we don't know much about them. I mean, they, they really are these enigmatic creatures. They've been around longer than just about anything. They're big, they're charismatic, they're the, you know, the lions and the tigers of the ocean. And our knowledge of their life cycles for a lot of species pretty much consists of they're down there doing things. Like, how do we know so little about these creatures that are so important to the ocean ecosystems? So there's 1,200 different species of sharks and skates and rays, and they're all the same thing. Rays are just flat sharks. Um, and the oceans cover 70% of the planet. They are the greatest producer of oxygen, the greatest carbon sink on the planet. The greatest ecosystem the planet has is the oceans and the most important. Um, but we live in a terrestrial world. We rip around on the surface and very few people get to scuba dive. Very few people get to go in submarines. People don't get to snorkel and see what's actually down there. So our experience of sharks is largely when someone pulls one up fishing or in a net or if a shark bites somebody. And that's led to the misconceptions that sharks are monsters and predators of people. And you know, you've maybe heard the stat, we've mapped more of the surface of the moon than we have of the ocean's floor. So the oceans are still a very you know, unknown world. And there's sharks in the dark trenches of the oceans that we've never seen before. Scientists discover a new species of shark every week right now. So and not just during Shark Week. <laughs> not, yeah, not every week is week. actually Shark Week. Every week, for shark scientists, for sure. Excellent. So really interested in sharks, became a biologist, a uh, marine biologist. Um, what, what made you have to tell this story? I mean, you went to some really incredible lengths to tell the story of uh, the decimation of shark species in our oceans. What made you wake up one day and say, I, I got to get this out. I can't just study it. I can't just do the science the world needs to know. So I woke up at 5 in the morning. Uh, on the most exciting photo assignment of my young career. Uh, I, I decided I didn't want to be a biologist. I didn't want to spend time with beakers. I wanted to take pictures and be in the wild with animals. And, and my career was working. It was going great. And I got an assignment to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. And 160 miles north of the Galapagos sits two islands called Darwin and Wolf, which are home to some of the most magnificent concentrations and migrations of sharks in the world. So I was up at 5 in the morning holding onto the bow of the boat, just looking, waiting to see these islands come into view. And as the islands came into view, there were these black sticks with, or like brown sticks with black flags on them. And there were long lines. And we found a fishing line that was 60 miles long, a fishing line that would stretch from Earth to outer space with 16,000 baited hooks and hundreds of dead sharks in the most protected marine reserve on Earth in a UNESCO World Heritage Site protected by the Ecuadorian military. We found sharks getting decimated. And so like that morning, I, I said, I'm going to do something about this. And I didn't know it would consume my life in that way. But I quickly found out shark populations had been decimated. They were down 70%. They were down some 90%. We were killing 100 million sharks a year for shark fin soup. 
And I thought that if we could get this message to the public, something would change. So as a wildlife photographer, I got magazine articles published in all the major magazines and all the big newspapers. I gave the photo stories away. I didn't charge for them. Um, just so we can get this message out there, we set up a fund with the Charles Darwin Research Station, a nonprofit in the Galapagos, so that people reading these articles, I thought, could donate money to putting a patrol boat in the Galapagos to stop this. And after a year and a half of this, our patrol boat fund got $1,300 in donations. And I'd spent every dollar I'd ever had as a wildlife photographer getting these articles out there. So it was really clear to me that unless we changed the public perception of sharks, unless people saw sharks, you know, not as menacing predators of people, but as important to this ecosystem, and maybe love them a little bit, would people fight for their protection? So I decided then to make a film, Sharkwater, so that we could, you know, change that perception. So uh, the, the opening scene of Sharkwater has you holding a shark. I don't know what kind of shark it is, but you're, you're stroking it almost like it's a dog. And I mean, dogs are another, uh, you know, ostensibly vicious predator that is part of our lives, that we don't view as this horrible, scary thing, even though they kill a lot more people a year than sharks do. Do you think we could get to a point where people view sharks as the dogs of the sea, as this thing that, yeah, it's a predator, but it's, so are we, and, and we have this kinship with them? I think it's important for people to see sharks as a framework for life in the oceans. So imagine if you had a fish tank and you put some badass super predators in that fish tank, and they're thriving and everything's good, any new animal you put in that tank is gonna be either wiped out by the shark or shaped by the shark in some way. It's gonna have to evolve a carapace, a shell. It's gonna have to get bigger than a shark. It's gonna have to start talking to its friends. It's gonna have to school. So imagine that's what's happened in the oceans. For 450 million years, our oceans have been shaped by sharks. They're like the unseen hand that's moving the ocean ecosystem. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think people are ever gonna have a relationship like dogs. Um, you know, five people get killed by sharks every year. So you're more likely to get killed by everything. Accidentally suffocating in your sleep in the United States alone kills 50 people. Yeah, you're more, I looked it up last night. You're more likely to get killed by your own toilet. Yeah. Watch out. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. So how do you go about changing that perception? I mean, this seems to be something that's fairly deep-seated. It's really played into by, by traditional media. I mean, you're here in town raising money for Shark Water 2. Uh, the movie industry is one that historically has not portrayed sharks in an at all scientifically accurate manner, like starting at Jaws, going all the way up to Blake Lively's latest movie. I mean, this is, this is a really uh, a tidal wave of perception that you're fighting here. Yeah, it is. And for some reason, we like to be afraid. We like horror movies. Horror movies do so well. If I was pitching a horror movie here at the Toronto Film Festival, I would be funded already. Um, so we, we like that. We like to have a monster. We like to be afraid. And, and so and sharks, toilets aren't the most charismatic monsters. No, they don't represent the same kind of fear. And with sharks, it's like they're the last thing in nature that has the potential really to take you down. So you know, everybody plays up on it. When a shark does bite somebody, they say the shark ate somebody. Where the shark like bit somebody, realized it got a human, and freaked out and let go. My toddler bites people as well. Yeah. Like, we're probably not making horror movies about her. No, no. Um, Okay, excellent. So, so you've got to go up against that. You've made two movies now uh, on that subject. Do you see perception changing? I mean, you, you saw some real results. Yeah, perception's changed. Um, so government policy changed in 85 countries since the first movie came out. Shark finning is legal pretty well everywhere now, uh, which is amazing. There's now a shark conservation movement. There were at least a dozen shark conservation groups created by people that saw our movie and said something has to change. And now when you talk to people about sharks and you tell them the sharks are being wiped out, people care. You know? So I, I do think we've made significant headway. You know, the public sees sharks in a different way now. And we got 124 million people to see shark water. So I, I think we, you know, we, I'm very proud to have played a, a small part in that, for sure. Um, and, and I think it, it comes at the right time. You know, I think the public's ready to see things in a different way. They're, you know, it, it's, it's brutal that we've been taught to fear something it's like any kind of fear and discrimination and prejudice. You're, you're taught it. It's not inherent. You don't, you're not born to be afraid of sharks. And, and that fear blinded us to the fact that they're being wiped out. You wouldn't be able to kill 100 million of anything else and have that just slip by. But because of sharks, it, because of our fear, it could happen. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go to the audience. Nami, you have a question? Can you use the, the mic? Yeah, we, just, we have people on, on VC. Well, yeah, no, it's just a quick follow-up question to Adam's question. So Sharkwater was 10 years ago, and you're saying all these conservation groups. Like, what's the state of sharks today? 
and I guess why I still make Shark Water two, or, or like, is it, I, I imagine there's still tons of work to do, but I guess just where are where are we with sharks today? Great question. Um, so after Shark Water came out, we thought we, you know, we kind of thought, yay, we did it, we saved sharks. Uh, shark fin imports to China dropped 70 percent. China banned shark fin soup at government functions. Yao Ming is a spokesperson for shark conservation. Jackie Chan came on board. Like the world started working for sharks. Toronto banned shark fin soup. New York, California, you can't even own shark fins in New York and California. Toronto overturned it when we weren't looking. Um, but there was a great, great progress being made, and it looked like the number of sharks getting killed every year declined. The legislation that mandated that you not fin any longer required that you bring sharks into port with the fins attached to the bodies. And so all of a sudden there were 100 million sharks showing up in ports and someone had to do something with the bodies. So now there have been industries created out of these shark bodies and Shark Water 2 is about where these other sharks are going. So right now scientists estimate we're killing 150 million sharks every year. 70 million of those are going into shark fin soup. The other 80 million scientists the general public has no idea. And so the, this movie. But you have some movie, theories, right? You've been investigating. We know. We know where they're going, and that's why we're making a movie about it. They're turning up in pet food, livestock feed, fertilizer, and they're being renamed and fed to you so you don't know you're eating a 450 million year old super predator that's essential to life on Earth. They're calling sharks flake and rock salmon and whitefish. And it's common in fast food sandwiches, it's common in fish and chips. The cosmetics industry is using deep sea sharks. Sharks that live thousands of meters below the surface, that have huge green eyes, jet black bodies. Some of them make their own light to communicate with each other. They can live 300 years. The cosmetics industry is hunting deep sea sharks for their liver to make squalene. And it's in high-end eyeliners and lipsticks. It's in some big brand cosmetics. And is this one of those products that they can actually synthesize? They just find it easier to grab these creatures from the bottom of the, the ocean? It's squalene that's in the liver, and you can make squalene from olive oil or sugar cane instead of shark. So why on earth would you go all the way to the bottom of the ocean to grab these? Because for right. some reason it's working out to be cheaper. Why? And is that just because these sharks were coming to, to port anyways? This sort of unintended consequence of this policy that said, you, you can't just not fin, you have to bring the shark back. And they said, all right, we'll just bring the whole shark back anyways. We There's a, a small percentage of the sharks are being targeted for their fins and their livers are being used, but the vast majority of these deep sea sharks are targeted specifically for their livers. Wild. Mm. Um, so your movies focus on sharks, but one of the things we were talking about earlier is they're, they're a bellwether species, a canary in the coal mine. Your movies and, and your whole activism is really about more than just sharks. What's at stake here? Oh. So Revolution, our second film, uh, is about how humans are going to survive the next 100 years. Because by the time we were done making shark water, we'd gotten to all these scientific conferences and met the world's leaders, and they're like, what you're doing with sharks is awesome, but we're going to lose everything. It's not just sharks, it's all of our forests. And they pointed out the studies and the stats of what's happening on the planet, and 75% of our forests are gone. 90% of the big fish are gone. Uh, by the year 2048, we look at a world with no fish, no reefs, no rainforests, and 9 billion people fighting over what remains. And human history dictates that when we are put into a position of lack, we fight over what remains. So the future looks brutal for us, considering we're not addressing any of these issues in a serious way. So we made revolution to try to bring this issue to the public, positioning it as save the humans. Like maybe if conservation isn't working, if saving pandas wasn't working, then maybe we could say, okay, save the humans, we gotta save ourselves, hoping that that would generate enough public interest. So maybe you don't have any sense of empathy for other species, but you at least have a sense of self-preservation. Yes, exactly. And so that's what Revolution was. Revolution came out in 2013. Um, and I don't know that it quite worked either. And I think what I'm realizing now is, is the, my theory is conservation has failed because all conservation is doing thus far is trying to slow down juggernauts that are so inherent to our civilization and ubiquitous in our society that even if we achieve success in those arenas, we're still gonna live in a hugely degraded world. Like, look, like we would be celebrating in the streets if any country said, I'll reduce emissions by 20%. And if you look at the studies on what's happening with e ecosystems, a 20% reduction in emissions will not buy us 1% more time in a hugely degraded world where we still have no fish, no reefs, no rainforests. It's so a little bit like you're all in a swimming pool and someone says, I'm gonna pee less than anyone else. I'm still gonna pee in the pool, but just not as much as these guys. Sure. Like, just not going. 
<laughs> it's maybe a little more severe than that. Yeah. Um, but like e even deforestation, even overfishing, we're like, okay, let's like consider our uh, our endeavors to make a sustainable fishery right now. We would throw up our hands and be like, yay, this fishery is sustainable, but we would have achieved one tiny sustainable fishery in a world that's already lost 90% of its life. That is unacceptable. And considering we're careening towards 10 million billion people and our consumption is increasing and we want to eat more of everything, that's still not going to work. So where do you start then? Because most people, they live in one region. You know, if you're a government, you have control over your fishery. How do we, how do we make that change if not one country making their sustainable fishery and then hoping that the next person does it. Like how do, you're talking about making an entire sea change across the whole species across the planet. How do we do that all at once? I think we need to usurp the current environmental predicament and instead of fighting against our problems, we need to fight for the world that we want. Uh, so right now, if you put enough biomass back on this planet, we could leapfrog over the current environmental predicaments. If you put 75% of the forest back, if you put the soil back, if you put the fish back, you'd capture enough life in that carbon that we could probably keep burning some fossil fuels. And so imagine a, a US president going in and saying, okay, everybody, we're not gonna burn any more carbon. We're gonna, you know, emissions have to go down. We're not gonna, no more manufacturing. He would be a, probably assassinated, right? You can't do that. Industries built this world. But if somebody came up and said, all right, we're gonna rewild this planet. We're gonna put nature back. You could kind of go around the environmental issues. And that sounds like something everybody, I think, could agree upon. And I think we're smart enough and connected enough. And we should be fighting for a world that's amazing for not just us, but for all species. Like the Don River should be thriving and full of life. Lake Ontario should be amazing. If you want to eat a fish, there should be enough fish everywhere. You can go and pull a fish out and eat it. And there should be enough food growing within our cities and everywhere that nobody's hungry. I think we need to be fighting for that world instead of fighting against these problems. Can we do that in our current economic system, or do we need to look at, at a fundamental change in the kind of companies we run, how we get paid, how we do business? I think the first is a, a fundamental agreement from society, and perhaps at, at a higher moral level, that maybe we shouldn't be destructive. Like, you can't go to your buddy's house for dinner and trash the place, right? And we're here on this planet trashing this place. Well, you can do it once, and then you're not coming you back. And unfortunately, yeah. we have no other house to go to here. Yeah, so I, I think we need to come to a, that fundamental understanding. And I think if you got the rules of the road right, things would change pretty quickly. If humanity c came back and said, okay, we're going to rewild this planet, then like six tiers down the line, you would see pollution becoming illegal. Right, but not right away. And pollution becoming illegal would unleash the genius of industry to do what it's doing without destroying the world we depend on for survival. Maybe we manufacture stuff out of garbage instead of manufacturing stuff out of the natural world. Do but you see anybody who's doing that well? Like, are there any, this is, this is an amazing vision. Is anyone even coming close to enacting it today? Ooh, uh, well, Denmark just banned all deforestation. Um, the government of Bolivia came up with something called the Cochabamba Accord, which gave Mother Nature rights above and beyond corporations. Meaning, if you destroy the natural world, you're going to go to jail. And I think that should be logic. I think we're going to look back on this time in, with astonishment at how we destroyed the natural world. Um, and it, that kind of stuff's going to be illegal in the future. It's our food, our water, and our air. It's clearly the most important thing on this planet. We've just built some systems you know, dependent on growth and we're propping those up with subsidies and you know, that, that stuff is going to have to change and, and I think ushering in this change in, in a way that makes the world more beautiful, more equitable, more amazing for everybody and everything it is the way to go instead of the current paradigm where like you're going to consume less, you have less cars, less driving, less meat, less toilet paper, less everything, you know? Vern, you have a, a question? Not me. I do. Uh, before the question, just a reminder for everyone on GVC, there's a dory. So if you have questions, please submit to the dory. Um, but I think there, there's two ways of, or two kind of arguments. One is changing the perception of the general population of people that want to do something good and saying they should look at sharks. But what's that conversation you have with people that, that want to do something good um, and, and understand the story of sharks, but there's so many competing uh, issues like you know, deforestation and, and the pandas and, and you know, rhinos, things like that. How do you get, how, what's that conversation to say sharks should be where you start? So previously I would tell people uh, to consider the, the importance of a, a creature. Um, and if you were to consider a world without pandas, it's not impossible to look at it and understand that the world's maybe not going to go crumbling down. But a world without sharks would be a radically different world for everything. So the importance of a creature in an ecosystem is directly proportional to how long it's been here, how many extinctions it's been through. So sharks are more important on this planet than pandas. Keystone species, categorically. Species. Um, 
But I think because we're in such a battle and because everything we love is in jeopardy, I think it's up to us to, to take what we're best at and what we love the most and smash that together into the way that we change the world. So if pandas are your thing and you love pandas the most, you know, you should be working on pandas. For me, it was sharks, and for me, it was art and film, and those two together are, are how I'm doing it. And I think, I think you know, working for a brighter future and a, and a better world is, is really good for everybody and everything. Um, but it's hard, and, and being difficult, you want to you sweep towards your strengths in that way. So do you see a, a variety of different paths to get there? I mean, you are taking your route through conservation and activism, but also media. I mean, you're, you're a, a big-time filmmaker at this point. You've got folks like Paul Watson and Sea Shepherd who are out there, like, literally you know, ramming boats and, and taking a very direct action. What are some of the other things that we could do if we care? Uh, you know, if Vern really does love pandas, uh, what are the other areas of society you don't see people taking enough direct action? I think the most important thing is discussion and imagination. Right now, people are unaware of the problem. You know, they don't know that our life support system is in jeopardy in that way, and that that's going to mean human survival is a problem this century. Young people do. Like, if you talk to any kid in, in grade school that's old enough to understand this stuff, they're freaking out. Right, because they look at the numbers and they don't justify their mortgage, their car, their previously consumptive lifestyle. Uh, but young people are just like, oh my God, we got to save the world we depend on for survival. What do we do? So I think discussing it is important because right now humanity's genius is not unleashed on this solution. Right now, you, we're trying to figure out how to make more money. We're trying to figure out how to analyze markets. We're trying to figure out how to, you know, build technology. And I hope Google, you know, gets us to a place environmentally somehow. You know, there's a the great amount of, of intellectual wealth in this company that could do a massive amount of good. But talking about this stuff, making it the issue, I think is really important. And then I think for us to get where we need to go, we need to imagine what the world would look like when we got it right. Like right now, if you imagine the future we're headed towards, it's pretty grim. Like there's no real plausible future that we're looking at where things are amazing. Like maybe we get to Mars, maybe we put some plants on Mars, but you know. But like this planet, it's rats, roaches, and us fighting over who gets to eat them. Um, and a few parks that contain some, you know, the last dredges of megafauna. But I think if we Under imagine, armed guard 24 seven. Exactly. But if we imagine what this world could look like, then we can start thinking about it. Like, we're not going to get somewhere unless we can see it. But what would the world look like when we brought nature into the cities? How do we bring life back? How do we pull pollution out of the oceans? How do we make Lake Ontario an amazing ecosystem that's propping up all of life in the cities around it? I think that's really important. Do you think, I mean, you're out there, you're constantly talking to people, uh, other activists, but also other citizens. Uh, are we going to see it before it's too late? I mean, this is, not, this is not a new trend. We're just, we're starting to get to, you know, the rock bottom. Are we going to realize that, turn around before we get, you know, before we hit splat on the bottom or, or, or not? I think we're going we're gonna to hit with some velocity. It's just how fast we're going to hit. You know, like, it, it looks like we, we've done a lot of damage already, right? Like, we, we've, we've really messed this place up. But there's a But the massive, consequences are about to become really serious. They're about to become really serious. So, like, coral reefs, they're thinking, coral reefs are gone worldwide in 10 or 20 years. Gone. That's 25% of the world's species. Um, this is a massively important ecosystem. And it's all happening faster than everybody thought. The climate projections are happening faster than people thought. They're, they're adjusting all of the fishing data because the math was a little bit wrong. And now it looks like we're killing way more fish and we've decimated more fisheries. So like, what I think we need to do right now is, is figure out how to make the, the landing or the, the hitting of the bottom as, as light as possible. So we don't go splat and have to rebuild civilization from, from the ground up. And you've got to take into account that there are massive technological advances that could, could help pull us out of some of this situation. If somebody does figure out fusion, a fan that, example. fusion, a fan that can turn carbon dioxide into bricks, you know, if we, like, some of these things we're going to have to bank on um, to, to soften that landing. That's a pretty bleak future. Um, how do you get up every day knowing that these are the consequences? I mean, you're, you're staring it in the face from the science, from the activism uh, standpoint out there in the oceans. Uh, how do you not lose heart? I, I see it in a totally different way. I think this is the most exciting time to be alive. I think we are gifted in the most beautiful way with this task and this challenge that's going to call out the best in us. 
we're the first generation in history that knows exactly what we need to do. We need to save the world we depend on for survival. We're not fighting a war for somebody else for oil. We're fighting to save our species, and we can be heroes. And I think young people are going to look at this and see that there's going to be more heroes created in this generation than in every generation prior, because we are going to rise to the challenge of saving this world. It's just what that's going to look like. So for me, like, I, I don't, like, sure, it sucks that we're destroying some of this stuff, but it's like, you know, when you're in war, you don't bemoan the fact that you're in it. You pick up a sword, and you run in, and you chop at something. So now it's just like, all right, get to work. We, we know what we need to do. Attack those problems. Yeah. Excellent. Vera, we have... Yeah. Um, to your point about Google being a technology company, we're not the only ones who are doing technology, and there's lots of entrepreneurs who are trying to develop different things that could be helpful? Like, um, you might be somebody who sees a lot of that. Like, is there anything that you've seen or heard of or anyone that you've talked to that got you really excited about a potential new energy source or, um, I don't know. I'm pretty excited about solar energy. It looks like that's coming in massive leaps and bounds. Uh, the 19-year-old kid that figured out how to pull plastic out of the oceans. If you've heard of that or seen those YouTube videos, that's amazing. And I think young people who maybe aren't bound by the, the restrictions of adulthood are going to come up with some solutions that are going to be amazing. I'm on the board of something called the OMEGA Project. And OMEGA stands for Offshore Membrane Enclosures for Growing Algae. It was developed by NASA to figure out how you could convert human waste into biofuel to continue to propel us into space. And what they figured out, basically, is that you could, using algae, turn human waste and municipal waste into fresh water and biofuel. And in the process, you sequestered and destroyed viruses and bacteria and heavy metals. So for an example, San Francisco Bay, if you converted 1% of San Francisco Bay into offshore membrane enclosures for growing algae, which is basically plastic bags in the ocean that float around and have algae in them destroying municipal waste, 1% of San Francisco Bay would take care of all of San Francisco's municipal waste and make 25% of its diesel fuel. So by working with ecosystems, by understanding nature, I think we can solve a lot of these problems. And, and municipal waste and runoff is what is causing 400 dead zones in the oceans. There's 400 areas of the oceans that have no life, no oxygen, nothing. And we can solve that problem like that. I think in the future, we're going to live in more closed loops where every time you flush a toilet in your house, that's going to go into feeding an ecosystem. Right now, we treat waste, which is massive nutrient resources. We treat this stuff as, as terrible waste, and we try to put it as far away from us as possible, where in reality, we could be using these things in a much more intelligent way, and we could be putting forests back where there are now deserts. Um, another question. Have you met any... So I think part of the frustration that a lot of people have is that leaders... Uh, whether they be business leaders or political leaders or whatever, are not doing, not doing enough. Who have you met that you feel like is in a position of power that gets you really excited, that you really feel like is doing something, if anyone? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that question. Um, it, it seems like world leaders that are in countries susceptible to the problems of the future, they're on board. And world leaders that might be able to uh, shield themselves from the problems of the future are less on board. They will talk about it, but are they taking you know, really significant actions towards ushering in that kind of future? It's difficult because they're in positions that have, they've gained through industry and through the financial input of some of the destructive stuff. So um, I'm not sure that there's one country or one world leader, I think, that, that's really nailing it yet from the first world perspective, for sure. And, and that's not my arena. I'm not, in, I'm not in politics, so there's probably, I mean, Denmark, if they've banned deforestation, maybe they've got somebody there that's really rocking. Priya. Um, yeah. Um, so I remember when that uh, Mal Malaysia flight went missing, and there was all these, like, rumors that they found parts in the ocean, and it turned out that it was just garbage, um, and they found, like, Starbucks lids and cups and all this stuff that doesn't really decompose or has no exit strategy. Um, so... I just wanted to get your perspective, like, what do you think is going to happen for governments to be way more regulated with the materials that manufacturers use? Because plastic seems to be terrible for the environment, doesn't decompose, yet everything I buy is plastic. Um, so what do you foresee as, as the change happening from a more, like, government regulation standpoint? 
I think pollution is going to be illegal, and I think disposable is going to be illegal. And if you do have to buy something and dispose of it, you're going to be taxed heavily for that disposal, and the selling of that product is going to be uh, enormously expensive. I think we've manufactured enough stuff. There's enough stuff out there that if you want to build an iPhone or you want to build a plastic tray, you should go to our garbage and mine that for those resources instead of going to the natural world or to new petroleum resources. And I don't think that's too far off. It's just. Right now, we've, we've let a bunch of companies run amok, and we're kind of catching it a little late, and now we're catching it. Like, you've got an average of a pound of plastic in your body, all of you, a pound of plastic, because that's what's in the environment. That's what's floating around. That's what's in the fish that you're eating, one pound. So you know, we don't pollute the environment. We know that. The same concentrations of lead and mercury and cadmium and arsenic that are in Lake Ontario are in your body, and you can test that by pulling out your hair and checking your blood. So we know we don't pollute the environment, we pollute ourselves. I think we shouldn't be negotiating with a corporation over what quantities of toxic contaminants they're allowed to put into the environment. It's like a little bit of rape. Like, it's not cool, even a little bit. I think pollution should be illegal, right? And I think the, the world in the future is, is going to usher in that. And you're going to carry your bottle to the grocery store, or you're going to make sure that, you, you know, maybe the lazy ones will have a whole room full of bottles that they got to take back and get their... You know, money from in the end. Or we go back to the old world where the milkman brought the bottle and then took it back. Like there are, mo there were models from before when plastic existed that mm. that were great, that allowed everybody to have milk in their house, and they didn't have to cart milk, you know, jugs back and forth. Um, so there might be some solutions that are out there already that we can that we can use. Uh, incidentally, with your pound of plastic comment, you just totally ruined Annalise's day, maybe her whole <laughs> week with that comment. Um, I want to I want to change gear a little bit and uh, and just personally, uh, you're a really interesting character. Are are you actually still technically a fugitive in Costa Rica? Paul Watson is still a fugitive from Costa Rica, and the uh, there's an international arrest warrant out for him with Interpol. So the only countries that won't send him back are America and France. But because we're shooting Sharkwater 2, um, we checked with the government of Costa Rica, and I'm not on a list. They gave you a pardon, but yeah. because he was the captain. If you haven't seen it, uh, in, in Sharkwater, they uh, take on a, a fishing boat called the Veradero, and uh, it's a really interesting story. Um, so we were talking before we started about how you, you lead a really interesting life. You charted a very different path. We come from very, very similar places here in Toronto. Um, uh, compared to most of the people you went to school with, you're basically Indiana Jones. Um, and uh, uh, what, what led you to lead that different kind of life? From, from the time I was young, I knew I wanted to do something different. Uh, my, my parents were in a fairly corporate world where you know, they were stressed out and they were in offices. And, and I just couldn't imagine doing something like that. And for me, it was always animals. It was always the oceans, adventure. Um, so I knew I was going to do that. And then I thought I found the dream job as a wildlife photographer. You know, using my understanding of biology and animal behavior, I could you know, get close to sharks. And, and it was when I found illegal longlining that you know, my life took a turn. And, and you know, the thing that I loved most was in jeopardy. And so I had to go into battle and save it and then figured out that you can't save sharks if we wipe out every other fish and humanity in the process because a starving human is going to fish the very last shark on the planet or eat the last panda possible. So we're very much all in this together. We've got to save everybody to save anything. So it's been, you know, there's no turning back. So you went into this life looking to avoid stress. You're now in like literal high seas battles, arrested in foreign countries. One of it, you broke house arrest to go and spy on the Taiwanese mafia, and not with like a spy cam, but with like a news camera. Like you have more stress in your average day than most people in an office have in their entire life. And I love that you got into this path because you thought that was too stressful. That's, you really care about what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd probably crumble far faster in that environment than I would in the one that I'm in right now. Um, I mean, I feel honestly so blessed to have encountered these crises in my life and to have figured this out because now I, I live a life of meaning where I know, like, even when it gets hard or even when I'm breaking down, you know, I'm, I'm working for a brighter future for humanity, for species, and that gives me so much more fuel to, to go through difficult times and to, you know, stick it out because it's hard. Like, I had no idea how hard making movies was. But we're competing for eyeballs with Game of Thrones and Ninja Turtles, and, and we're trying to, you know, we're feeding people information they do not want, right? Like, 
the information on all this is out there in the world and you are not digesting it en masse because people don't want it. They don't want to know that there's a pound of plastic in their bodies, that their consumption of this, you know. Annalise as soon as, really doesn't want to know. As soon as people know this information, their morals engage and they have to behave differently. And, right, the greatest predictor of human behavior is the expectations of our peers. So as soon as your friends and family know something, you've got to behave differently. So we're trying to figure out how to give people what they don't want in an entertainment medium that we ask them to pay for. Um, so it's hard. Each of my movies has taken four years to make. And it's not because like, we shot for four years. It's because it's like, how do you deliver this story in a way where people want to digest it? Um, so it's but, the writing part of it and, and crafting the story that you find the hardest? Finding the money, I think, is the hardest. That was, well, that was, yeah. I had a whole bunch of questions that I wanted to ask about like this industry that you know, they'll fund Jaws. You've got this total, totally antithetical uh, story that you want to tell. It's not exactly a feel-good movie. You're not making Transformers. How do you find the, the financiers for it? It's it, uh, begging and pleading and not quite stealing, but uh, you know, everything we can. So Sh Sharkwater took four years. Um, when, when I started making Sharkwater, I was 22. And I'd never shot a video camera before, uh, but I managed to borrow $50,000. And I had a credit card, and I got a heritage grant from uh, Warner Brothers and Universal Studios in Canada. And so I had enough money to rent the most expensive HD cameras in the world, and I left. And I got on a plane, and I, you know, by the time I came back, we were... Did they have any idea what you were going to do with those no, cameras? No, no. I mean, I was making a pretty, I was making like a pretty underwater movie about sharks right. for everyone's mind. But I came back with corruption and espionage and attempted murder charges and machine guns and mafia rings and hospitalizations and this crazy story. So it wasn't until I'd, I'd almost made the movie did people really believe in it enough. Because nobody believed in a 22-year-old that had never made a movie before. Right, like people, particularly these industries, they want track records, they want believable right. stuff. So unless people you keep show giving them. Michael Bay money regardless of the results, because yeah. he delivers at the box office. Yeah. So, um, so uh, now Sharkwater was successful financially as a conservation campaign and everything, and that's made it easier to get money. We get money from Canadian government agencies. There's now funders that invest in our movies. Um, our second film, uh, Telefilm Canada, gave us a bunch of money to release that movie, even though we slammed the Canadian government in that movie. So, you know, there's, the, Canada is a very beautiful place to live if you're a filmmaker, because we do have tax credits and incentives and, and some government funds that will help chip in to support projects like this. Fantastic. Um, so we're far away from the ocean here. Big body of water right there. Something about it inspired you as a kid. What can the rest of us do if we're really interested in, in helping and in forwarding this mission? To understand that the decisions you make, no matter how far away from the oceans, affect the oceans in profound ways. Um, most of the carbon we put into the atmosphere gets absorbed by the oceans. The oceans are the biggest carbon sink on the planet. Uh, they regulate oxygen concentrations. They're home to 80% of life on Earth. 90% of the habitable space on Earth is the oceans. Uh, so if you're burning carbon here, that carbon's going into the oceans. And the oceans are 30% more acidic than they were 100 years ago. And if you know from health, you know, a change of acidity in your bodies of a few percent will kill you. The oceans being 30% more acidic means anything in the oceans that builds a skeleton, uh, which is fish, coral reefs, phytoplankton, which is most of the oxygen in the air that we breathe, that stuff has problems in the future. So to consider that, uh, to consider what you eat, you know, and, and, and the, the, there's two levels to, to this conversation, I think. One is, is to, to be less destructive. So to consider what you eat, shrimp fisheries, for example, on average, waste 85% of what is brought to the surface is killed and thrown back as bycatch. 85%. So a lot of fisheries are enormously destructive. So if you're going to eat fish, make sure you ask questions. What, what is this fish? If you've never heard of that fish before, ask what, like there's not an orange ruffy or a, or a Chilean sea bass. Those don't exist. They've renamed fish so that you are more likely to eat it than you are to eat a Patagonian toothfish. So to ask these questions, be a, a conscious consumer, and, and I think you really should do this because now that you know some of this information, you're bound to me morally to make better decisions. Um, so to be less consumptive, and also to try to, you know, when you're in discussions with friends, when you're considering careers or, or your life path or whatever, to, to maybe look at the future and imagine how we can make this place amazing. So I really do think that that charting a pathway towards that is most important, and I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna get there, so I will rely on your intellects as well to help us. Excellent. Uh, do we have any more questions? Yeah, Nomi. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking about how to ask this, because you know, 
I, I saw Revolution, for those who haven't seen it, it was, in my opinion, like one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Um, and I talked to a lot of people about it after I saw it, and I was like, you know, the, the sound bite that, you know, it's like an information war, so, you know, it's talking sound bites, and the sound bite I use is, hey, did you know in 50 years we're gonna have no fish, there's gonna be no oceans, like, there's gonna be no, the oceans are gonna die in 50 years. And, you know, that always surprises people in the same way that, you know, you have a pound of plastic in your body. Like, we need sound bites to convey this. The challenge that I have is, you know, 90% of the, the responses you get from people, and, you know, I, have, I generally think I, like, have friends with good people, is, well, we're, we're kind of screwed. It's like, let's eat all the sushi we can because, you know, there's going to be no fish in the ocean in 50 years anyways. It's like, how do you fight that information? But, like, you know, I know you said we got to hit rock bottom, but is there anything we can do to convince people before we hit rock bottom? Because there's gonna be a small percentage of people, like you said, that care, that envision the future, that wanna change, but there's gonna be a lot of people that are saying like, you know what, it's over anyways. You know, like the, the, the oceans are gonna be screwed, you know, the rainforest are gonna be screwed anyways, so why change behavior? And I guess, what are the sound bites that you would use to fight that those people or to, to change perception with those folks? Yeah, I agree, that is a, a significant battle for sure. Um, and I don't think we need to hit rock bottom. Um, What's amazing about right now is, is the biggest movement that's ever existed is rising to the challenge of saving our world. There's more than a million NGOs and charities around the world that are working on this. You know, there are people that are dedicating their lives to this, they're independently funded, they're trying to save this. So, and that's only growing. Every year there's more money going into this than, than the year prior. So I really think we are tackling this. And, and when you do consider the previous conservation paradigm, which I'm exiting right now, of fighting against the problem, um, in that world, all of our efforts mean just like we're still going to hit rock bottom and live in a degraded world. It's just, you know, me eating less meat for my life might buy us 0.00001% more time before we hit the bottom. So why bother? I get that totally. I think what, what's going to pull us out of this is, is like, is maybe human ambition. Like, what, what are we, like, are we, like, are we capable of something more than, than we've been here? Like, Maybe it's a spiritual or moral question, but I think we're smarter, we're more intelligent, we're more compassionate. I do think we give a shit. I think when we're educated and somebody tells us something and we do understand what's happening about the oceans or you do learn about what's happening with shrimp, I think each of you might consider the shrimp thing a little bit more when you're going to eat shrimp in the future or should you choose to do so. So I, I think it's, it's the brighter future that's going to get us there. I think if we stay fighting against the problems, we're, we're still gonna look at the world where we're gonna hit rock bottom anyways. I think we need to, we need to rise up and, and usher in a new world where we evolve out of this destructive, like right now we're cancer on this planet, right? If you consider how we're behaving. Stage four cancer too. Yeah, we're just, we're consuming this place and destroying it. Um, and, and I think, I don't, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like that's me. That doesn't feel like the skin I was in. That doesn't feel right to me morally. And when I look at why we're in that situation, I feel like we're in that situation because we've let some of our systems go a little too far. We built systems of capitalism and systems of corporation at a time when we had an infinite amount of stuff and the damage we did was negligible. You know, when we had 200 million people on this planet, you could do and excrete whatever you wanted. But now that we've got seven plus billion people, we're running into these thresholds. So I think we, we really just have to you know, take stock and look at this. And, and as much as we think the individual changes in our lives are gonna do it, they're not gonna do it. You can change your light bulbs, you can be vegetarians, you can do, you, that, that stuff is gonna help something and, and the changes that those help are gonna be more apparent as we get into the future. But we need, we need bigger change than that. We, we need industries to change, we need governments to change, we need to stop considering growth as a paradigm when we don't have a, an infinite amount of stuff to grow into, and other parts of the world want to be pulled out of poverty and out of this world. So it's like being environmental entrepreneur instead of environmental consumers. Yes. So yeah. Nami said, it's like being an environmental entrepreneur instead of an environmental consumer. And, and if you think about, like if you think about what, if, you, if you're looking at stocks, you're looking at trading, you're looking at investments, you're looking at the industries of the future, there's a massive amount of room for environmental entrepreneurs. Like, we're gonna have to figure this stuff out, right? So investing in those worlds with your time, your money, and your energy, I think, is, is hugely important. When the consequences are literally, potentially the end of humanity, the companies that get that right, they're the ones who are still gonna be around, the mm -hmm. ones who are gonna succeed. So if you're making long-term investments, those are the most logical ones to go with. Um, it sounds like you're saying we need, to, we need to sell a dream of a better life. Um, and that's what's gonna turn people around, not just talking about mitigation and slowing down 
uh, slowing down what we're currently doing. Can we expect that, some of that attitude in, in, sh in Shark Water 2 and showing us what, what our life could be like and should be like? Yeah, for sure. Um, that'll be part of Shark Water for sure. Um, we've got a concept called Wildify. We're trying to put into the world. Wildify is going to mean to bring back nature, to rewild the planet. I want everybody to start talking about it. I want to push it. We'll, I don't know exactly what form it's going to take, but I think that needs to be, that, that needs to be our goal, and that, that'll be in this movie in a big way. Is how do we put the life back in the oceans? How do we make the ocean? Like, the oceans have so much to offer if we propped them up and left them alone in little bits of ways. If we manage fisheries properly, we would catch more fish than we are right now. Um, we just need to do it right. So very much so, focusing on that. That said, the most exciting and you know, interesting part of this movie is you know, we've got a window into a mafia warehouse in this movie that they don't know exists. So we've got some crazy stuff for the movie, but it is in that old paradigm of showing you what you know, is going wrong. Right. So we're going to have to play the balance of, of showing what's going wrong to shock people and make people go to a movie theater to watch this movie and then hopefully help co-imagine the world worth fighting some for. Some carrot, some stick. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see it, man. Thanks for coming in. Beautiful. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming.